Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you had a good evening and are enjoying uh, your breakfast this morning. Can we thank those who are serving us today? Thank you very much for that. Well, this morning is a very special morning for me. It was 13 years ago in 2003 that uh, my wife Jill and I joined the Young Presidents Club and we came to our first Presidents Club meeting here at the Reagan Center. Uh, we loved everything we heard at that meeting and uh, decided to continue our support. Uh, I joined, we, we eventually joined the Real Presidents Club after the Young Presidents Club. Uh, I came to work for Heritage four years later. I've been here for 10 years. And now my wife Jill and I are members of our Legacy Society. Uh, we couldn't be prouder of our affiliation with the Heritage Foundation. Well, our breakfast this morning is hosted by our Legacy Society, which some of you may know is that very special group of members who have remembered heritage in their wills or their living trusts or through a designation of some sort. Members of the Legacy Society have chosen to send heritage to a place where they cannot go into the future to ensure that heritage remains faithful to its mission, building an America where freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society flourish. We have over 2,000 members of the Legacy Society who have told us that they've done this. Nearly 70 of them are with us at this meeting, far too many for us to read each individual name. And so we have the names uh, scrolling on our screens. For those of you who are members of the Legacy Society, would you please stand so that we can recognize you and your commitment? Thank you so much for that. Uh, the, the, the folks who just stood represent $42 million in income for the Heritage Foundation in the future. They make a huge difference uh, in, in the future of our movement and, and our country. If any of you would like more information on joining the Legacy Society, please feel free to talk with me or one of my colleagues. We would be delighted to serve as a resource to you as you make this very important uh, decision. I mentioned that our Legacy Society members have decided to send heritage to a place they cannot go into the future. And I can't think of a more important way that heritage does this than our Young Leaders Program, which is our emphasis this morning. While heritage is focused on achieving conservative policy victories today and in the next week and in the next upcoming year, we're also committed to building and strengthening the conservative movement for years and decades to come. That means we're committed to identifying and training the next generation of conservative leaders. We do this in a number of ways, through lots of different fellowship programs, but most prominently and most overtly, we do this through our Young Leaders Program. Since 1981, Heritage has made a deliberate effort and a significant investment to nurture the next generation of conservative leaders. We've hosted thousands of interns during this time, many of whom have gone on to take up the mantle of leadership and are making a real difference in our society today. We're privileged to hear from one of those alumni this morning. We have a brand new video, two minute video, that talks in greater detail about the Young Leaders Program. So I'd like to show that video now and then I'll introduce to you our director of the Young Leaders Program. Can we roll the video please? Our country's at a turning point. I hear about it all the time. Our young leaders talk about how policies are affecting their education, how it's affecting their parents' business, how it's affecting their local schools. And I really believe that our young leaders have the ability to change that. And I'm hopeful. But the change starts now. Every semester, Heritage takes in 60 or 70 interns for a total of about 200 each year. They come from schools from all across the country. There are big schools and small schools, private schools and public schools, liberal arts colleges, Ivy League schools. This is not your normal internship. You're not just fetching coffee or making photocopies for the duration of the summer. You're working closely with a particular expert in the field. You're embedded in the work. You're participating in all the activities that take place in the Heritage Foundation. The Young Leaders Program is different from any other internship program in the country. Our policy briefings are in-depth policy analysis as to what's affecting the country, but also the conservative viewpoint. But we also want them here. 
They're embedded in the fabric of the Heritage Foundation, and we care about their personal success. Our one-on-one -on -one mentorship offers the opportunity for interns to get networking experience and counsel for their professional goals. All in all, you're not just an intern, you're a core part of the Heritage Foundation. We give them a direct supervisor. It affords them the opportunity to know the work entrusted to them is pivotal to the work at the Heritage Foundation. And our first principle series truly talks about the beginning of conservatism, the founding of this country. The Heritage Foundation's internship program is really the gold standard of internship programs. I interned for the Heritage Foundation in the summer of 98 and that was the most invaluable experience for me. It really helped springboard me into my career at the Federal Society where I oversee 200 law school chapters and um, the, the Heritage Foundation's internship program is unique because you're getting real substantive work. The, the internship program is, is central to what Heritage is trying to accomplish here. Heritage is trying to train the next generation. Through the Heritage Foundation's internship program, these students come out prepared. The purpose of the Young Leaders program is on the one hand to make you a better conservative, to get you some practical real-world experience in Washington, D.C. with a prestigious organization. And the preamble to our Constitution teaches us that in America, we need to secure the blessings of liberty, not only to ourselves, but also to our posterity. There must be an abiding concern with training the next generation of citizens so that they too are capable of enjoying and transmitting the blessings of liberty. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Helena Ramirez Richardson, whom you just saw in the video. She is our director of the Young Leaders Program. Helena is a native of Puerto Rico, born to Cuban emigre parents, and raised in Miami. She earned her BA from Florida International University and was chosen to serve on that campus's uh, University Board of Trustees because of her leadership on campus. Uh, last year, she was named to Forbes' 30 under 30 list of influential leaders in law and public policy, and this year, in 2016, she joined Heritage as our new director of the Young Leaders Program. Helena, please come and tell us more about this program. Thank you. Good morning. It is such a privilege to join you today. The Heritage Foundation Young Leaders Program is campus outreach. It's young professional engagement. It's building an alumni network. It's also the best internship in this country. The Young Leaders Program provides opportunities that amount to incredible uh, and great things, as we can see with our Distinguished Award recipient today. And on behalf of the over 3,000 alumni, and I would like to also recognize the 56 interns that are graduating this fall class, I would like for them to, be, to rise and say hello. <laughs> they graduate on Thursday. We thank you for your generosity. Come 2017, we're looking to identify, recruit, develop, and grow. We want, to, we want to identify the next generation of young conservative leaders. We want to recruit them to come and be part of our Young Leaders Program. We want to develop their leadership skills and grow the conservative movement um, and enact conservative policies across the country. I would like to introduce you a great uh, supporter for the Young Leaders Program, Mr. John Brenning. Bruning completed his undergraduate degree at Penn State and a master's and PhD in electrical engineering at the University of Illinois. He began his career at Bell Labs and eventually made his way to a company called Tropel, a manufacturer of precision optical systems and advanced metrology instrumentation in the semiconductor, data storage, automotive, and industrial markets. Bruning, along with some colleagues, eventually purchased this company in 1994 where he became president and eventually so sold it to Corning. Along with his wife, Barbara, who is here with him today this morning, they have a passion in investing in the next generation of young leaders. He serves on the Board of Trustees at the University of Rochester, as well as is invested and involved in the Rochester Museum and Science Center. John and Barbara have invested in our Young Leaders Program by endowing the John and Barbara Bruning Intern at Heritage in 2012. John, thank you so much for your investment of time and resources to the next generation. Please come and introduce the next speaker. Thank you.
Well, it's really a great pleasure to be here with young and old alike. Uh, it is my uh, great pleasure to be able to introduce Tom Cotton, the Distinguished Alumni, in, Intern Alumni Award recipient for December of 2016. I'd like to start my introduction <clears throat> of today's speaker with a remarkable story. In May of 2006, Army 2nd Lieutenant Tom Cotton deployed to Baghdad. He led a 41-man air assault infantry regiment as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Only a month into his tour, Cotton did something extraordinary for a combat officer. He emailed a letter to the New York Times. <clears throat> In it, he criticized the paper for publishing an article that gave details about a secret Bush administration program that monitored terrorists' finances. Cotton charged that the newspaper had, quote, gravely endangered the lives of my soldiers and other soldiers and innocent Iraqis here. Cotton was afraid his supporters would reprimand him or even court-martial court -martial him, but he knew how to write an effective letter. After all, <clears throat> his acute political awareness had been honed in part at townhall.com, then a Heritage Foundation website. And in 1997, as an undergraduate at Harvard, Cotton served in the Heritage Foundation's intern program. The Times ignored Cotton's letter, but it was published in Powerline, a prominent conservative blog, and from there spread like wildfire over the internet. Ultimately, he was reprimanded in several, <clears throat> he was reprinted in several <laughs> newspapers. <clears throat> It finally reached the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, General Peter Schoomaker, who forwarded it by email to all his generals. The generals stated, quote, attached for your information are words of wisdom from one of our great lieutenants in Iraq. When Cotton finally met with his battalion commander, he was simply told, next time, give your chain of command a heads up. <clears throat> the Heritage Foundation is very proud of Tom Cotton. His former Heritage intern story of conservative leadership is still unfolding. In November of 2014, Tom Cotton won election as a junior senator from Arkansas. At 39, Tom is the youngest U.S. senator. <clears throat> Tom also served in Afghanistan. In fact, he decided to join the military after 9-11. He saw clearly who our enemy was, understood the threat they posed to our country, and chose to devote whatever abilities he could to see, uh, <clears throat> to perfect the nation he loves. This is the kind of man conservatism wants to see in the limelight a man of principle who gets it when it comes to threats that face our country at home and abroad, and who wants to do something about it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. John, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, John and Barbara, thank you for being here. And thanks to all the members of the President's Club for your generous support of Heritage uh, and their Young Leaders Program, the interns in particular. Um, now, the, John didn't tell you the full, the full details of that story because not everyone knows them. They haven't all been published, although I've been struck at the amount of time that story come, has come back to me 10 years later. 
Um, let's just say I, did. I didn't expect it to have such a long shelf life. So, <laughs> um, so I, I did write that letter to the New York Times uh, back in the summer of 2006 after they had revealed the details of something called the SWIFT program, which is an international program to track terrorist financing, which they didn't even dispute, was well briefed to both parties in Congress, supported by our allies, supported by law, uh, and therefore disrupted efforts that were completely legitimate to try to disrupt terrorist financing. At the time, though, my unit was um, on long-range patrols to a small uh, outpost about five kilometers from our big base. The big base is you know, what you've maybe seen in movies. It had internet, it had gym, a gym, it had a big dining hall. Uh, the small base, very small. Uh, didn't have any of those things, totally cut off from the outside world. And we'd be there for uh, 96 hours at a time and then back at the big base for 36 hours. So I was on one of those 36-hour refits when I read that story, caught up on some email, and fired off what some people might call an intemperate note to the New York Times. And then I was gone for another 96 hours, cut off from Armed Forces Network television, cut off from the Internet and news. So I didn't know any of this that had happened in the meantime. Uh, and then I got back to the big base, and I got out of my Humvee and a private from the company commander's uh, little tactical operating center came running up to him and was like, sir, you gotta see the commander now. It's like, what's wrong? He's like, I don't know, but he's angry, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so he asked me if I'd written an op-ed in the New York Times. I said, no, I wrote a letter to the editor. He's like, well, we gotta go up and see the battalion commander. So we go up, as John said, to see the battalion commander. Fortunately for me, he was in the green zone that night. Um, and the XO, the second in command, told me that's like, yeah, you, He'll be back tomorrow and you can see him in the morning, but uh, I'm not sure if this is gonna turn out well for you or not. And so I spent this night, you know, very worried that just, you know, about a month, maybe two months into my time in Iraq, that all the, all the things I had worked for over the last two years through basic training and officer candidate school and ranger school and airborne school, it might be coming a cropper. Maybe I'd lose, uh, lose my platoon leader position. Um, fortunately, that night is when a colonel in the Pentagon forwarded me the email from General Schoomaker, uh, who had given his blessing to what I had said in that letter. And uh, I didn't hear from the battalion commander all day long. And finally, it got time at about 1800, 6 p.m., to do my daily patrol. So I go up to the battalion uh, tactical operating center to drop off my mission plan. And the battalion commander sees me, and he points at me, and he goes like this. <laughs> I go over to him and says, uh, did you see the chief's letter? I said, I did. He said, you know, I'm supposed to, uh, you know, yesterday I was supposed to chew you out, right? I was like, that's what the XO said. He said, you know, today I'm supposed to punch you in the shoulder and tell you where to go, right? <laughs> I said, I didn't know that, but I was hoping that it might be something like that. <laughs> and at that point he said, in the future, we're not trying to restrict your rights since every soldier has a right to state his opinion in a letter to the editor. Uh, we're just going to encourage you to tell your chain of command something I've I tried to do with my chain of command, even in the Congress. <laughs> what I'm doing, they would prefer that I not. Um, it really is great to be back with Heritage Foundation. Uh, as John mentioned, I was an intern myself in 1997 when I was assign assigned to townhall.com um, back in the very early days of the internet. For some of you interns here, those were back in the days when you actually had to like, log into the internet and dial a phone number to connect to it. There was really screechy sounds as the phone number was dialed. And uh, you know, imagine if it's just like one bar on your phone when you're up in the mountains. That's how, what it was like when you were sitting at your desk at the Heritage Foundation. And they were on the cutting edge. Um, but it was a great program. We had probably 50 people that summer. It was the first time I'd ever spent any extended period in Washington, D.C. And we did important work in curating news stories and developing our own content. But what I remember more than anything than the work I did sitting at that desk in the town hall section of Heritage are the relationships I made, the, the friends that I made that I, I still know today uh, that are out working in business or who are prominent lawyers or who I later found myself in, in law school with or helped me on my political campaigns, as well as the relationships we had uh, with some of the senior staff at the Heritage Foundation who, who treated us like valued members of the team, who treated us as if we were there to contribute essentially to the work, but more importantly, we were there to carry on the work in the future. Um, and now that I have my own interns, um, many of whom have either gone on to or come from the Heritage Foundation, I see the same thing, that, that not just are they valued members of my team, we have them because we need them to contribute and get the work done, 
but more than anything, we want them to go out after they leave Team Cotton and continue to defend the principles on which I campaign and on which the Heritage Foundation has been built for many decades. Uh, that's what I remember most about my time at the Heritage Foundation. Um, and I, I know it as, as some of the folks here who are a little bit more seasoned in life, think about what you've accomplished in life. You think about what kind of legacy you're gonna leave. There, there are a few things that you can do better than to support these young men and women here who are in the Heritage Foundation intern program. Because you, you don't know what kind of impact they're gonna have in their communities on our country, but I can tell you that impact is gonna be profound. And, and your generosity really does make the program essential. Um, I hope, Jim and Jeff, that next year when we repeal the death tax, it doesn't hurt contributions. <laughs> but, but I know, I know that you, you give your money to the Heritage Foundation, you give it to support the President's Club and the internship program, not because of what the tax code says, but because you believe in this country and you believe in the things that allowed you to have the success that you have and you want to see your children and your grandchildren have the same level of success. I, I know that very personally now. We have a 19-month-old uh, at home, and as I was telling my, my breakfast table here, uh, you dodged a bullet in getting me today. My wife is going to be induced later tonight um, <laughs> with our second child. And, and, uh, and it's, it's three weeks early, so when I committed to this, I didn't know that it was going to happen on the same day. But, um, but as I look at my little toddler, um, when I'm not trying to get him out of the Christmas tree, uh, or I think about my, my baby that's on the way in just a few hours, I, I think about the kind of country that I'm going to leave behind for them and all that my parents and my grandparents did for me. You know, my dad was a Vietnam veteran. My grandfather was a World War II veteran. And the sacrifices they made, both fighting for our freedoms overseas, but also just the day-to-day sacrifices that they made to build a better life for me and for my sister and in our little town and in the state of Arkansas and in our country. And I know that, that all of you here today who support the President's Club are dedicated to building that better future. And I just want to say thank you so much. As someone who benefited from it in the past as an intern and as someone who benefits from it today given the work that the Heritage Foundation does, given the kind of talent you produce. But I want to address the second group as well. I want to address those interns that stood up earlier. Uh, and now I'm going to ask you to stand up again so I can see you from, uh, from this angle. If you're still here and they haven't put you back to work. <laughs> so thank you all for standing. Um, and you can, I can tell, you know, this is, I think this is a common feature in life. You look back. Um, you look back on what you've accomplished, and then you look at what people like these young interns have accomplished at the same stage in their life, and you think, man, I could never get a Heritage Foundation internship today. <laughs> it's like when I, I review the applications of Arkansans who are applying to our uh, service academies, and they're just such amazing young men and women uh, who are motivated by all the, the right things. Um, you interns are, are very blessed to have had the opportunity that you've had. And you're going to go on to maybe another internship, maybe a study abroad program, maybe go back to college. Um, I bet a lot of you probably think that you have a plan in life. Um, and that's a good thing at your age to have a plan. But let me tell you an even better thing. And it's probably something that could be seconded by a lot of the gray hairs in this room. Uh, it's better to have your plan written in pencil. <laughs> because you, you never know, you never know what, what the world is going to throw at you. Um, I would have never told you 19 years ago that I'd be standing here in front of you today accepting your Distinguished Intern Alumni Award. I didn't even know there was a Distinguished Intern Alumni Award. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you have joked about who's the head intern this year. But, um, you know, I, I thought I'd probably go to law school. I thought I might practice law. And there's a, a good chance I'd be doing that today, that maybe I'd probably be somewhere in Arkansas, maybe working in private practice at my own farm in my little hometown maybe working as a prosecuting attorney, maybe working as a judge, maybe working in the attorney general's office, doing something that would hopefully be rewarding and allow me to provide for my family. Um, that didn't happen. That was because the 9-11 attacks happened. You know, that was the most consequential day in my life and, and the path that it put me on. Obviously, we would have never predicted that in 1997. 
Um, most people here will have something like that in their life. For some people here, it probably was 9-11. Um, for other people, it was a tragedy in a family. Maybe it was an opportunity they got that they didn't expect in the workplace. Um, maybe it was a chance to run for public office. But whatever you think your plan in life is right now, there's probably a good chance that you're gonna have to make a detour, that you're gonna have to use the eraser on your pencil. And that's fine. It's important that you recognize that at this age, it's important that you seize those opportunities and that you overcome those challenges. Because if you don't, you might end up a politician like me. But <laughs> more importantly, more importantly, if you do, you'll find your own life is so much more enriched, so much more rewarding. Because whatever I would have been doing right now, and again, I could have taken a lot of different detours in life. Um, I could you know, probably be a company commander in the Ranger Regiment or a team leader in the Green Berets right now. I could be working on a division staff overseas in Iraq or Afghanistan. It would have been incredibly rewarding and I would have been happy with that work. Maybe I could have built a successful law practice. Maybe when I got out of the Army and went into business, I would have stayed in business uh, and provided jobs and opportunity for people in my community. Maybe I could have stayed in graduate school, which I started and then promptly left. But but there are going to be moments in your life when you probably have to call an audible. And along the way, you'll begin to realize that maybe you're not the one that's in charge of your life. Um, and if you focus on what's going to be there at the end of your life, the legacy that you can create and that you can leave for others, those around you and those that you love, your husband, your wife, your children, your grandchildren, just like so many people here have been focused on, you'll realize that you have lived a rich and rewarding life. And it's the, the experiences you gain, the service you render to others, your family, your friends, your countrymen, that will ultimately define and reward you in life. This internship has been a great opportunity for you. Some of you will probably stay in touch with each other for the rest of your lives. Some of you may end up marrying each other. I think that's happened once or twice in the history of the Heritage Foundation. But, but it'll, it'll start you on a path of service to your fellow man and to your country that I hope you never stop. And again, you don't have to be a politician. You don't have to be someone who's vastly successful in business the way so many of you are to contribute to your fellow man, to contribute to your community and to your country. There are countless ways to do that if that's what your focus is in life ultimately. And I would just encourage you to keep that in mind as you go forward. And I would just say once again, thank you to everyone here in the President's Club who supports the Heritage Foundation and in particular who supports these interns that we have. I'm, I'm reminded in, in closing of an old drill sergeant I have, tough old Irishman, um, but toughest by far, the loudest yeller, the one who would uh, make, make us do the most push-ups, who would keep us up latest at night, toughest on inspections of our weapons and our equipment. Um, fortunately, he wasn't my drill sergeant. He was in another platoon. <laughs> but we were in the same company, so we got him once every four days. And one, and one night he had said, um, you know, you all think that I, I want you to fail. You all think that I'm trying to set you up for failure. Um, and nothing could be farther from the truth. I want each and every one of you to succeed. I've been doing this for over 20 years now, and I've seen a lot of things, and I'm pretty broken down, and I think I've earned a chance to put down my rucksack and sit at home on the porch with my wife and enjoy a beer. Someone's gotta be there to pick up the rucksack, though. And I'm here to make sure that each and every one of you are ready to pick up that rucksack when I take off this uniform. And for all of you interns, you carry on that same responsibility. Sooner or later, you're gonna be in a position to make a difference for each other, for your fellow man, for your country. And some of these gray hairs, today, gray hairs here today, they wanna to make sure that you're ready to pick up that mantle of responsibility. You've had a great opportunity over the last few months to get ready for that. Continue to do so. Continue to carry forward the legacy that they're passing on to you. Thank you all. God bless you.